Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Miri Ben Chaim. I'm the director of the Division for External Studies of the Robert H. Smith Faculty of Agriculture, Food and Environment of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Welcome to the first PEARS webinar in Plant Sciences. This is our first adventure. This is a breakthrough of the Hebrew University, and this is a first webinar. And I wish you the best of luck and good morning. Professor Shuki Saranga, the head of this program. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, again, I welcome you for uh, the Pierce uh, webinar in plant sciences. And uh, we shall start right away with uh, our schedule. And our, our first speaker today will be a, a keynote speaker, Professor Shachal Abu. Professor Shachal Abu is from the Hebrew University of uh, Jerusalem, Faculty of Agriculture in Rehovot. He works on uh, crop domestication, genetics, and physiology. Uh, and Shachal Abu will give us a talk on plant domestication uh, in the ancient Near East and its bearing on future plant breeding. Shachal, please. Thank you, good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to speak a little bit uh, on my work. And I hope that uh, by the end of the talk I will be able to convince you that indeed the two parts of the title are related, ancient processes and uh, future. Uh, and first of all, before I forget, I would like to acknowledge uh, most of the ideas and, 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 and data and, uh, that came out of this work were a result of interaction with uh, many people. And here you see uh, just a few, uh, few of them, students and colleagues, including uh, the head of your program. Um, the, the lecture will be divided into two. The first part, in the, in the first part, I will talk a little bit about uh, certain aspects of plant domestication in the ancient Near East. This is a very big topic and we can spend a, a whole course and in fact, a lifetime discussing it. Uh, so I will just give you uh, one aspect of, of my, of of that, uh, of that topic. And the second uh, part, I will focus on uh, chickpea adaptation, a test case of how can we study from ancient, how, how can we use studies of ancient processes and, and in order to improve uh, future prospects for, for plant breeding. Now in the n ancient Near East, it is, um, if you read the literature, you will find uh, tables of this kind. This is just an example. And people refer to uh, uh, a group of crop plants as the founder crops. These are the most ancient crops that were domesticated by ancient people in the Near East. And these include uh, two species of wheat, diploid wheat, which is today only a relic crop. It is not of a very, uh, it is not of any economic importance except some traditional farming systems in the Balkans and, and Turkey. Um, emmer wheat, which is tetraploid wheat, or durum wheat, which is a major crop today. Barley, lentil, pea, chickpea, bitter vetch, which is a forage crop. And flax, which was the first fiber crop of the Near Eastern agriculture. The map of the, of the Near East, physical map, you see those mount, this mountain area that stretch along the eastern part of the Mediterranean to present-day Turkey, Iraq, and Iran. And the, uh, the geography actually creates a very distinct rain pattern. Most of the Near East, as you know, is desert. But that part, again, that mountain belt that I showed you earlier, is uh, um, 
what we call uh, has a typical Mediterranean uh, uh, climate, which is basically two seasons. You know, four seasons is a piece of music by Vivaldi, but in the Near East we have only two seasons. Dry season, which is ending now, and a wet and cooler season, which will start sometime next month or sometimes even later. From December to February, we get 80% of our precipitation. And this stretch of area gets between 350, in some certain areas 800, but, and it creates what, again, in the literature is called the f fertile crescent because of its shape. And in the center of that area, here, for instance, in e eastern Turkey, this is how the landscape looks like. You get an oak pistachio woodland. Even 400 millimeters of rain can sustain uh, a perennial uh, oak and, and, and uh, pistachio trees and grasslands growing in between them. And this is the arena of the Near Eastern plus dom plant domestication. When we look in distribution maps of those species that I showed you on the, in the table uh, earlier, we see that uh, ain corn wheat, tetraploid durum wheat, barley, lentil, pea, bitter vetch, and chickpea. Those, those areas on the map depict the natural distribution range of the wild progenitors, where we can find the wild plants that were the, those that were used by ancient people to domesticate uh, the plants. Interestingly enough, if you put all the maps in superposition, one on top of each other, you will see that only in this area, they, you can find them all. For instance, you cannot find uh, wild chickpea here. You cannot find uh, um, acorn wheat here, okay? So only in that region, we find all of them occurring in uh, natural habitats. One among many interesting questions is, are there any similarities in the processes of domestication of all these crops? Okay. Uh, some people refer, or let's say the, the common knowledge, the common knowledge, that the prevailing paradigm that you will find in the literature is that uh, like here expressed by Danny Zohari, who is a world leading authority and composed several books on the topic. The domestication of lentil and pea, which are legumes, is not very different from that of wheat and barley. This is, as I said, the prevailing paradigm. And the rationale is that in both crop groups, both in the cereals and the legumes, part of the domestication process involved for instance, loss of seed dormancy. The wild types have seed dormancy while the domesticated plants do not. And similarly, wild plants have natural seed distribution mechanisms like the spikes break down, shatter in the wild plants, and the pods of the legumes open. While in the domesticated plants, this does not happen. We have indehiscent pods and a non-brittle uh, spike. Now this approach stresses the role of automatic selection by ancient men, and we will soon see why. If you look at that part of the abstract by Zuhari, he says that the, cha the changes from the wild type seed dispersal and wild type dormancy to the domesticated phenotype are best explained by assuming that mutations causing loss of wild type adaptations, these are those traits, are automatically selected for soon after people transferred the wild plants, the wild progenitors, into a system of planting and reaping. Just by the fact that man is planting and then takes a sickle and cuts the plants perpetually year after year after year through many generations, this will give advantage to the domesticated phenotypes. And therefore, they will be selected ju just, just by the action of man. Now, this, this is a focus on phenotypes, on traits that minimize yield losses. This is understandable, but to me, it reads like a typical 
Western productivity oriented approach. Again, there, there is nothing wrong with it, but I will try to present a, an alternative which examines the differences rather than the similarities between these two crop groups, between the legumes and the cereals. And I think that by studying the differences, we can study more or again build another brick in the building of, put another, lay another brick in the building of, of knowledge. Now the major biological differences that distinguish the uh, uh, legumes from their companion cereals are depicted in this table. In terms of population structure in the wild, legume populations are patchy and thin and cereal populations are massive and thick. And I will show examples. Plant stature. Most most of those Near Eastern legumes are creeping plants not more than 30 centimeters tall. The legumes are tall plants sometimes reaching stature of more than 1.5 meter. In terms of their growth habit, if, and I assume that most of you are agronomists, you should know that most of the legumes are indeterminate while cereals have determinate growth habit. In terms of the dispersal units, Legumes have camouflage seeds, while cereals have owned spikelets. And in terms of seed dormancy, even, again, legumes have 90% seed dormancy, while cereals have only 50% seed dormancy. I'm talking about wild plants all the time, remember. In terms of their floral biology, the legumes are cleistogamous. It means that the anthers shed the pollen while the flower is still closed before opening of the petals. And cereals have between 0.1 to 10% outcrossing in natural populations. So this is again a, a dramatic difference. Combining all these traits, because phenotypes are integrated in the living plants, gives us a result. The cereals are mostly aggressive plants or at least those that were domesticated compared with the legumes which are poor competitors. So you see that by tabulating a very simple list of traits, we can see that these two groups are very, very different uh, from each other. So there is at least a basis to start with looking at, the, at those differences. Uh, treating each of those of those items in the table require more time that Shuki allowed me. So if you are interested, you can get this, uh, look at this review. If any one of you do not have access, I'm happy to send it by, by email. And we will just check three of those. Population structure of cereals. In wild cereals populations, you can go today in Israel and Turkey and harvest some something like one kilo of seeds. You can harvest spike material that will allow you to extract from the wild spikes about one kilo of seeds per hour of foraging, per hour of collection. This is a stand of wild barley. A student of Real took the photo. If you are going to look for wild uh, chickpea or wild lentil, you will have to accustom to this posture like this poor student over there. This is a wild chickpea plant. It is difficult to see the plant. This is a wild lentil plant. And for scale, you see my pen knife. So the plant is no longer than that. And if you calculate what you can extract from wild populations at the time when the pods are beginning to mature, we did it. You see that the potential yield is mostly less than 10 gram per hour. So we are not talking about kilos per hour. We are talking about meager few grams per hour. So this tells you that you cannot treat wild lentil and wild wheat similarly because the potential of the plant is is different and we can again fairly uh, we can assume that 
also ancient people were unable to treat them similarly. Now, as we said, not only populations are small and patchy in, in, in legumes, the legumes also have indeterminate growth habit. This is a big wild lentil plant. You can see that the upper, that while, while in the upper internodes there are still flowers and immature pods, at the lower internodes there are pods that have already shattered their seeds. So at any one time when you visit a wild lentil or a wild chickpea a population, it is, you can only harvest a certain and rather small fraction of the total yield, okay, because of this indeterminate uh, growth habit. If you compare this to what you see in cereals, the, the development and maturation are rather synchronous, and it is, again, a different, a different picture. So if, if we come to the last point, the competitive, the strong competitiveness of the cereals compared with the poor competitiveness of the legumes imply that sowing and tending of legume fields was imperative for securing reasonable yield. While this was not quite necessarily with the cereals. Uh, and, and again, this may have inspired the ancient development of, of agrotechnics for legumes, which was not necessary for cereals. An interim conclusion, Histori in historical perspective, the difference, uh, uh, the different biological features of, of, of the legumes and, and the cereals require different treatments by the ancient farmers. And as a result, each crop group and even each crop in its own right had a different uh, uh, evolutionary trajectory under domestications once people have decided to domesticate. This is evident from the present pattern of barley and wheat cropping systems. Uh, wheat and barley and pea, for example, are much cover much larger area compared, for instance, with uh, chickpea or lentil in present day modern system. And now we go to the uh, chickpea test case. And uh, here, maybe in a, in a delay, maybe I should have uh, uh, stated it earlier, but this is the rationale of the whole talk, of the whole approach of my work on this, on this topic. The potential of every crop plant is by definition a function of its evolutionary history. Therefore, if we take such an approach, it may help us to understand the genetic basis of the yield limiting factors of the crop. And if we understand the yield limiting factors, this may open us um, new avenues, new ways uh, uh, to assist breeders in, in improving uh, crop plants. If we look at this, uh, uh, of this table again, and we, we should all remember that all those plants in the wild are cool season annuals. Cool season annuals in the Near East means that they germinate after the first autumn rains. In this area, it is sometime in October uh, and November. And by the late spring, they mature and disperse their seeds and dry off. Similarly, the domesticated plants that were domesticated from these wild progenitors are all cool season annuals. Winter is, uh, uh, wheat is either a, a winter crop or an autumn sowing crop. However, chickpea is a traditional spring crop in the Mediterranean region, which is entirely different from all the rest. How does it look like? If you travel in, in Eastern Turkey in June, you will see that all the wild annuals in that oak pistachio woodland belt, they are all dry. You can see them here. However, chickpea, a chickpea field is still green at that time of the year. This is no surprise because it is planted in the spring. So despite its origin 
as a cool season annual. In most of the traditional growing areas, chickpea is a post-rainy post uh, crop. It's a post-monsoon crop in India, in the Indian subcontinent, and a spring crop in the Mediterranean basin. Here, for instance, Aleppo in Syria, this is the rainfall pattern from September to May, and this is the temperature pattern, and traditional planting will be in March or even in April, at the end of the rainy season. Similarly, in India, planting is, for this, for example, in Kanpur, in October, during the cooler time of the year, and after the end of the monsoon, okay? So the plant, the crop, the chickpea crop grows on residual, what we call residual soil moisture. But crop which rely on residual <laughs> soil moisture have a limited potential yield. Why did the ancient Near Eastern farmers gave, give up the opportunity to grow chickpea during the rainy season like they do for wheat and barley? The reason is very simple, a disease with the name of Ascochyta blight, which devastates the crop. And in the absence of uh, chemical pesticides, this is the only way to avoid the disease is to plant the crop after, after the rainy season. The life cycle of the pathogen, the life cycle of the pathogen includes both a sexual stage and an asexual stage, and in both cycles, the formation of the spores, the ascospores or the pycnidiospores, is dependent on repeated rainstorms. So if you plant your chickpea crop after the rainy season, there is hardly any risk of blight. And this was an ancient way to avoid the risk of the disease. Low yield, but stable. Low yield, but secured. So the pathogen spreads via rain splash, and as I said, the only way to avoid it is to plant it after the rainy season. But germination, under domestication, in March and April, result, resulted in, in, in a unique adaptation profile this unique adaptation profile as a spring uh, crop allowed the adoption of chickpea from the Near East to the Indian subcontinent as a post-monsoon crop. Is it simple to convert a cool season annual into a spring sowing annual? What did it take? Again, if we re resort to this list, you will note, maybe you are aware of the fact that wheat and barley and also pea are known to have vernalization requirements, or at least in pea and barley, there are winter types and spring types, okay? This is the, this is the ancestral situation. Wild wheat, wild barley have vernalization requirements. What is vernalization? Just uh, a, a short uh, uh, definition. It is a growth period under suboptimal temperatures which, which accelerates flowering. And this is a major adaptation uh, in temperate, uh, for temperate plants to avoid frost damage for precocious early flowering at the end of the winter or in the early spring. So it delays flowering to the right uh, season. Now, is it possible at all to satisfy the vernalization requirement for a plant which is planted in the spring? The vernalization requirement for winter wheat and winter barley are satisfied because they are planted early in the season and stay under the snow or grow in a cool season during the winter. So it is no surprise that we find titles like this in the literature. That vernalization in chickpea, you know, if, if somebody who writes a paper asks such a question, it means that the conclusion, you can know that the conclusion before reading the article 
you can know, you can guess that the conclusion is that the vernalization is an artifact. Okay? And indeed, when tested, domesticated chickpea do not show vernalization uh, response. But we have to assume that the ancient farmers had to get rid of the wild chickpea vernalization requirement in order to convert it into a, chick, uh, into a, a spring sowing plant. And when you go to eastern Turkey in the right time, in November, you will see that the wild plant has already germinated. So it will be there exposed to snowstorms and low winter temperature. And here, this is a vern this is a mistake. This is a vernalized plant. And this is a control plant. You see that the vernalized plant look entirely different. And when you look at the uh, domesticated chickpea, you can not see any effect. When we look at flowering data, we see that by vernalization, we can advance flowering time of wild chickpea by more than 20 days with hardly any effect in domesticated chickpea. And we can also see this in F2 progeny derived from a cross between two such lines. So the history of chickpea as a crop involved two contrasting selection cycles. In the ancient times, it was converted from a winter annual to a spring crop. And in modern times, we are trying to convert it from a spring crop to a winter crop in order to maximize its potential. And when you undergo such contrasting selection cycles, you lose uh, traits because of genetic erosion. And these traits includes, include and are not limited to ascochyta blight resistance, vernalization response, and cold hardiness. Domesticated chickpea is very poor in terms of its cold hardiness. And those lo lost traits correspond fairly good to what you again, what people write in the literature as the major limiting factors for, for, chickpea, uh, for chickpea production. So again, you see that the yield limiting factors are in fact mirror. They mirror, very simply, they mirror the uh, evolutionary history of the, of the plant. Now in, in in the recent decades, chickpea is emerging as an important rotation crop in temperate growing regions uh, in, in the United States and also in Canada, in the Great Plains. But in that area where they can plant winter wheat, they cannot plant winter chickpea because it is killed by the severe winter. They plant chickpea only as a spring rotation. And again, its yield is very limited. Um, I hope that I managed to convince you that in, 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 in the wild, in, in its nature form, wild chickpea is exposed to sub-zero temperatures. So if we resort to this gene pool of the wild chickpea, we have at least a hope to improve the cold adaptation and maybe by reincorporating vernalization requirement into modern high yielding uh, uh, domesticated chickpea, we can convert it into a winter uh, crop. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Shachal. Uh, yes, you're just on time. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, some time for discussion. Uh, we will take questions from the audience first, if there are any. Can it be that the time then when mankind started domesticating cereals and then when it started domesticating legumes could make a difference in their different adaptation characteristics or it, or it doesn't I'm matter? I'm not sure I understand, but the, um, both cereals and domesticated are thought to have been domesticated at the, at the same, same time. time. There was no uh -huh. lag in uh -huh. time. Like first they domesticated cereals and after 2,000 years or something uh -huh. like that they domesticated. Again, the common knowledge is that they were domesticated together because they complement each other both from agronomic uh, point of view mm -hmm. and also from nutritional point of view. So we cannot think, or for me it is hard to think mm -hmm. about a community 
that lives on wheat alone and after 800 years say, mm -hmm. hey, why don't we domesticate uh, a few legumes to have uh, uh, hummus with pita, you know? <laughs> it doesn't work like that. No, but maybe the other way. Let's say since uh, uh, gathering uh, legumes is very difficult, maybe they started growing uh, legumes while uh, the, the cereals were abundant out there yeah. in nature, so it was very easy to collect them? It is possible. Uh, uh, it, there is even, uh, I mean, some people even mentioned it in the, in the literature uh, just once, that maybe legumes were the first crops. But most people that deal with plant domesticate, they concentrate on cereals, so they don't give attention to, the, to this idea, to this notion. In chickpea? No, in any, any crop. I don't know. Uh, well, uh, just a second. Uh, uh, Dr. Al Friedman did not have the mic, so I will repeat his question. He asked if there are any examples that genes from the wild were used to enhance yield in any crop. Yes, Al? Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert for uh, utilization of wild uh, germplasm in plant breeding, but uh, we all know an, an, an old paper by Tanksley about uh, uh, wild rice enhancing uh, yield in uh, nature sometimes in the early 90s. Uh, what we are trying to do is not using wild uh, alleles or wild traits to improve yield. We are trying to improve adaptation by improving its survival ability in colder environment. I'm not sure we are talking about increasing yield potential. We are talking about widening the, the, the area, widening adaptation. This is entirely different. So, uh, but we didn't look into it, for instance, in chickpea. In my, in my work, I didn't look into it. We have no, for example, we have to support, uh, uh, <laughs> we have no example for uh, wild chickpea which has better resistance to, to diseases, for example. The domesticated one are, are, are superior. <laughs> so. Other questions from the audience? So I have a question. I mean, we have, uh, Shachal and me, have many hours of discussing these uh, issues, but still, you know, there are still some questions that uh, we are asking ourselves, and I would uh, like to, to raise this question which came to my mind while he was talking. Shachal, the, the assumption about the area where uh, agriculture bega began, the cradle of agriculture, okay. is that uh, all Wild, wild relatives of the, uh, um, how do you call them, of the uh, ancient founder crops, founder crops uh, were located in a certain region, and therefore this region is the cradle of agriculture. Then my question is, is it necessarily that agriculture started in a region where all these wild species uh, uh, were available? Could it, uh, could it start in another region and then migrate to the other region? Could it start, let's say, with a um, part of these founder crops and then migrate to other regions and not necessarily in this particular area? In principle, yes. In principle, you are right. But if you look, I, I did not have time. And as I said, I, I was just focusing on, on certain issues in this talk. If you look at this map, the numbers here are the numbers of our, our, the numbers here stand for archaeological sites from which um, archaeobotanists have excavated the most ancient dated forms uh, 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 finds of, of domesticated cereals, for example. It is very difficult to distinguish domesticated chickpea from wild chickpea in archaeological material because all we have are the seeds. But in wheat and barley, we have the remains of the spikes. And if the spikes are not broken, it means that they are non-shattering and it means, or the assumption is that they are domesticated. So the, the, uh, our hypothesis that this is the cradle of agriculture does not rely only on the distribution maps. It relies on dated 
archaeological material and it relies on many other archaeological considerations like for instance many ancient technologies of using flint, arrowheads, and etc. start in this area and radiate. We have gradient of dated archaeological material. So this, this area uh, is, uh, was uh, um, uh, an area of, of innovation at some time in, in prehistory. Uh, but uh, you are at least, I mean, you are right at least in terms that most of the scientific community do not uh, believe in our hypothesis and they are fighting us. So you are in good, uh, in good company. <laughs> <laughs> most people think uh, otherwise. I, I, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you a sim simple argument. You know, some people say that here because you have wild wheat, and domesticated wheat, it was impossible to domesticate because the wild plants always were pollinating the domesticated crops. So there was introgression of the wild type alleles. So people could not have isolated, because of the introgression pressure, could not have isolated the domesticated forms. So what is the conclusion? If you take this argument in full scale, what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that you could have domesticated only in Europe, west of the Balkan. So maybe plant domestication actually started in, 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 in the Balkan or in Europe, and then the idea was trans transferred back to the Near East. But the archaeology doesn't show this mark. So uh, the, the, Europeans, the Europeans find it very difficult to believe that plant domestication and actually ancient Europe, Western civilization started in the Near East, you see? It is very difficult for them because they do not estimate us to be <laughs> worthy of such innovation, so. <laughs> anyway. Other questions, please? Okay, if so, we shall thank Professor Shafalabu. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, we have something like eight minutes for uh, to start the to start the next presentation with that we will start on time. So uh, we will wait a few minutes here. Matomel. זה הבחור שמודרך על ידי אייל. לא, לא, על ידי אייל. אהבתי. זה מופיע אצלך כרגע? כל פעם שתהיה הפסקה נחזור לזה.
using a timer to follow up your... Okay, yeah. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, good morning again to those that have joined us on the web. Uh, we are. We will continue now with the student presentation, and the first one will be Habte Nida from Ethiopia. Abte uh, graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Plant Sciences from University of uh, Hawassa in Ethiopia. He has been uh, working as an assistant researcher in Werer Agricultural Research Center, which belongs to the Ethiopian Institute of Agricultural Research, and he was there involved in areas of uh, crop improvement. And Habte will give us a talk on the uh, investigation of genetic loci involved in reproductive heterosis in sorghum bi bicolor. Habte, please. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Professor Saranga. The title of my presentation is Investigation of Genetic Locus Involved in Reproductive Heterosis in Sorghum Bicolor, conducted under the supervision of my advisor, Dr. El Friedman. So again, the title of the uh, presentation is displayed here, Investigation of Genetic Locus Involved in Reproductive Heterosis in Sorghum Bicolor. So to define heterosis uh, over hybrid vigor, it is the phenotypic superiority of a hybrid over its inbred parents. Here this picture shows that this picture was taken from our experiment this season, so this, uh, the, the, the plant is a middle, is, is a hybrid, and this one is one of the parents and the other parents, so you see here clearly the, the variation between these three genotypes. So, so the, the question behind this one is, uh, the, so far there is no answer for this. I mean, the, the genetic mechanism behind this phenomenon is 
not known. So there are models of uh, heterosis are still currently used. So the first model is the dominance model in which recessive alleles are different loci complemented in the hybrid. So in the illustration here you see you have a recessive small a and small b from uh, coming from or inherited from two parents p1 and p2 and you have also a dominant favorable allele b uh, capital B and capital A coming from p1 and p2 so in the hybrid the two recessive uh, deleterious alleles will be complemented by the two dominant alleles so this is the hypothesis uh, supporting the dominance and it, it was developed in uh, 1808 by Davenport uh, the other the other hypothesis opposing this idea is that um, you have here the illustration here. You have a, a homozygous situation in both parents in one of the chromosomes from P1 and P2, but you have a different allele combination. So you have here B asterisk and B asterisk in one of the parents, but B in the other parent. So this is assuming that there is a no dominant relationship between the two. That means between B asterisk and B. So in this case, you will have intralocus interactions. That means interaction between the two locus. So in this case, you will have superiority of the hybrid over its, uh, both of its homozygous. And this idea was independently developed in 1808 by Shell and East. Uh, another, uh, it's a kind of uh, genetic intermediate between the two. So the seed over dominance refers, you have here the illustration that there is a uh, tightly linked dominant alleles with recessive deleterious alleles in both parents. So these are tightly linked in repulsion or in trans arrangement. So in the hybrid, they appear to be like uh, an overdominant mode of inheritance and you will have advantage from this combination. But truly this is the dominant case so these are these, uh, two of these are the major models of heterosis uh, known so far, and this is a genetic intermediate, but truly is a dominant one. These are some of the examples. Uh, contribution of over dominance heterosis in maize by Lou et al. in 2003. Again, over dominance for reproductive traits on a population of tomato interrogation lines. In this study, um, they have showed that uh, they identified other forms of gene action other than overdominance for other traits, but they identified overdominance mode of inheritance for reproductive traits in tomato interrogation lines. Again, another study on maize uh, immortalized in F2 population, they uh, correlate heterosis with partial dominance and overdominance for plant hate. In maize, this is uh, the Hua et al. in 2007. Again, another um, study, this is from a recent finding that uh, brought by Gore et al. and Macmillan et al. So from their um, uh, investigation, they say that pericentromeric regions may contribute to heterosis. This region is uh, known for low recombination rates. And maize also genome, they, they show that maize genome contains um, many uh, pericentromeric regions. So this region has uh, residual heterozygosity. So because of this, they propose that this region may contribute to heterosis as well. Another recent example from a single gene mutation. This is uh, the most profound example done in 2010 by Craig et al. So they show that a single mutation or a single heterozygous uh, gene may confer uh, heterosis in tomato. So let's see now how the genetic um, loci were detected or developed uh, in Israeli sorghum core collection by a PhD student in our lab. Uh, it was done by uh, Imri Ben Israel. He, he is a PhD student in our lab. So he did um, a dialysis scheme and a, a different set of approach. So if you uh, see this, the first three and uh, the first two, they used um, F2 or interrogation lines. So they used mapping populations to generate or 
uh, to scan the genome or its genomic scan using mapping population. Uh, this was um, a mutation. So this is a uh, thought from a presentomic region. So that means a contribution of this region for heterosis. But um, in this approach, um, the idea is genomic scan, but the approach is a bit different. Here, uh, you have uh, initially there were about 200 uh, sorghum collections which represent uh, uh, sorghum from throughout the world. So they were studied for polymorphism using 51 SSR markers. Then 20 founder lines were selected based on their diversity and relatedness. You have here founder line 1, 2, up to 20. So these are uh, selected based on their diversity and also relatedness. Then after that, they were crossed in a dialog scheme. Here you have the hybrids 1 and 2, for instance. You have hybrid between 1 and 2, so you will have um, a hybrid here with a homo heterozygous situation. One chromosome coming from one of the parent or one of founder line and the other from other founder line. So you will have here heterozygous T, or in some cases you may have homozygous locus. Uh, in some cases you will have heterozygous locus. So this is uh, continuing up to the uh, hybrid 1920, so all dialysis scheme. Then after crossing this, uh, over dominant heterosis was calculated using this formula. So if the hybrid is uh, between the two parents, you will have an over dominant uh, heterosis value of zero or else if you have uh, the hybrid is either higher than both parent or lower than both parent, you will have a positive and a negative over dominance heterosis value. So based on this value, uh, mean of ODH value of each of, uh, each of the plant is calculated and the mean is calculated from uh, each plant for each hybrid. So after that, a genomic scan and association of Overdominance heterosis with heterozygosity has been conducted. Here you see that if you see locus X, you will have individuals. These are these dots represent each of the hybrids. So you will have this hybrid containing the heterozygous locus, where uh, having the high ODH value. This is in a y axis is the level of uh, heterosis, and you have here the homozygotes and heterozygotes. So in locus X, you see that uh, the heterozygotes with this allelic combination were significantly higher and strongly associated with the level of uh, overdominance heterosis. So this was the approach to develop uh, heterotic locus. In other locus, in locus Y, uh, more or less you see very uniform level of heterosis between the heterozygotes. So this is the approach. So after that, here you see on chromosome 4, one locus was uh, strongly associated with heterosis in 2010, and also it has been confirmed in also in 2011. So then after looking the um, significant marker here, then a scan for additional markers, that this is uh, zooming in on the left, uh, no, on the right, so here you see that in this region, most probably you will have some kind of genes or uh, gene families uh, contributing for heterosis. So you see here on chromosome 4, in 2010, it was significant. One of the markers was significant. Then looking for additional marker, uh, additional significant marker was identified in 2010 also. So therefore, in this region, uh, there is some kind of gene mediating heterosis. So the, our assumption was uh, to test this marker. So this, this marker was the marker that I tested in F2 population. This was in F1. So the objective or the hypothesis was this marker should behave as uh, heterotic in F2 population as well. If it is uh, heterotic in F1, it has to be heterotic in F2 as well. So we have to see the contribution also. So the objective was uh, to uh, verify this heterotic locus in F2 population. 
and also with the specific ob objectives of developing genetic markers, defining HTL4 genotyping, genetic analysis of parental lines and uh, derived F2 populations, analyze genotype, phenotype of selected markers, as well as as a separate study we did a study of, uh, to characterize and define sorghum panicle development. So 240 F2 population of each of the crops were planted in rows along with their parental line and their hybrids. And planting was arranged in three blocks, each of the blocks containing about one third of the, the populations and randomly spread uh, three replicates of parental lines and F1 hybrids. So out of this, as DNA extract from F2 parent and F1 hybrids using standard method, and a total of 204 and 147 F2 plants were genotyped for the candidate locus. And out of this, 170 and 146 of the genotyped F2 plants were considered for gen genotyping and for further analysis. Some plants were discarded due to poor establishment uh, in the experimental site. So the methodology used to genotype the marker was, here you see um, a relatively new approach. It was originally supposed to be separated on a high resolution melt analysis. Here you see this is um, a relative level of um, um, fluorescence here on a y-axis and uh, melting temperature. So whenever you have a different uh, amplicon, you will have a different pattern of uh, melting curve. So this was supposed to be, I mean, our uh, genotype were supposed to be separated on a high resolution melt analysis, but we couldn't get uh, consistent and reliable re result from this one. So we used uh, gel to separate the amplicon. So uh, it does pretty well. Here you see the two homozygotes. Homozygotes, this is parental one and parental one and the two are parental two. That means look like the other two parents and this is a hybrid. So it was separated on a high percentage gel. Data on uh, plant height, steam diameter, uh, fresh leaf weight and steam weight, as well as other traits uh, measured as an agronomic trait. And on panicle also, dry panicle weight was measured after oven drying for two days at 70 degrees and also panicle length measured from the same panicle. Uh, and beyond this, uh, we go into detail of the panicle architecture, like primary branch number, primary branch length, secondary and tertiary branch number, 100 seed weights. This is to, because there is a, a extensive branching nature in sorghum and to see which of the influences characteristics or sorghum architecture is contributing for uh, yield, <coughs> as well as to see the multiplicative effect of the different traits coming from the different parent. So we did um, a dissection experiment on this also. So here you see the sorghum panicle we have here, the primary branch. These are the primary branch. Then in bottom third, in the long branch zone, according to Brown et al., we selected two, two branches, two primary branches randomly. Then from each of these two, we select, um, calculated secondary and tertiary branch as well as, yeah, tertiary and secondary branch. As well as we measure the length of the two branches, then finally mean of the two branches were uh, used to characterize each of the panicles. And also, uh, finally, the, the panicle was stretched to determine 100 sheet weight as well. On a different experiment to see the shoot apex development of sorghum, we did another experiment here you see. Um, starting around 28 days after sowing, there was a transition from vegetative to reproductive structure. Here you see the, the, the picture, a doom-shaped uh, apex growing. So after that, we sampled four plants every four days from two embryo lines, so two founder lines. So here you see developing sorghum panicles and measuring it with a specified scale and later we uh, analyze it for the length of uh, the apex. Data on test on chi-square distribution of the F2 genotype, analysis of variance on agronomic and panicle tricks as well as calculation of overdominance heterosis as well as retain, uh, percent retained in F2 population was done. 
So let's see now what we identified from our experiment. This is a genotype segregation at F2. So you see that uh, in both populations, this is in population one and this is in population two, two crosses. In both cross, there is no significant difference between, uh, uh, according to the chi-square distribution, you have a one-to-one -one distribution. So the population was uh, segregated according to the chi-square distribution. Uh, this is a uh, plant height in uh, both populations. This is cross one and cross two. Here on the y-axis is a plant height, and uh, an axis is the parent one, F1, the parent two, and the three F2 population. So here you see there is heterosis for plant height as well. Parent one seems to contribute for high uh, parent alleles. In this case, also a bit is better as compared to the second parent and the third parent. Uh, so there is heterosis for plant height, but there was no significant difference between the three genotypes. You have the homozygote one, parental type one, and the heterozygote for the candidate locus, and the homozygote two, this is parental type two, but there is no significant difference uh, in terms of plant height. Again, there is also no significant difference between the two. Plant, the first uh, I mean plant P1, that means a parental type one, seems to contribute for more of the high parent uh, alas. This is a steam diameter. Again, there is a heterosis for steam diameter as well. This is parent one, and this is parent two, and F1 in the middle. So steam diameter also increased with uh, the heterosis level, but there was no significant difference between the three genotypes. This is a freshly phrased, again, you see clearly uh, difference uh, heterosis in terms of in F1. You see here, this is parental type 1 and parental type 2. Again, a small um, increase probably, but uh, it was not statically different between the three genotypes in fresh weight. And here also, more or less similar, the two parents on left side, a bit lower as compared to the uh, the f 2 but there was no much significant difference in the second cross. Uh, but you see clearly there is a heterosis for fresh leaf weight as well. This is a steam weight. Again, there is a much uh, significant heterosis in F1. This is parental type 1 and 2, but there was no uh, significant difference between the three genotypes in F2. Similar in the second cross also. But uh, here we see that there is a, a bit interesting uh, inter uh, result here. This is a dry panicle weight of the three genotypes, uh, genotype for the candidate locus. You have the homozygote one on, a, uh, on left side and homo two on the side. This is for the, the two cross, this is cross one and cross two. You have the dry panicle on a y-axis. So you see that there is um, some level of uh, heterosis due to heterozygous as single locus. Here you have about 23 and 10 percent increase in dry panicle weight due to heterozygosity at a single locus. So, if you agree with uh, me with the probability level, 10 percent probability level, probably, so there may be contribution from this locus. So, in both population, you see there is an increase here in 12 and 17 percent increase in dry weight as compared to the two homozygotes. This is a dry panicle weight of. Uh, the parent one, parent two, and clearly seen uh, heterosis level, or there is a huge increase in dry panicle weight in F1. Again, uh, dry panicle weight, this is in comparison to the F1 and the other parent as well. Here you see that there is also this variation in uh, between the three genotypes. So the heterozygote tend to be higher as compared to the two homozygotes. Maybe this is, uh, even it's, uh, it indicates that there is significant difference as compared to parent one type uh, marker, but uh, maybe statically is similar to this one. In this case also, in the second cross, you see the heterozygote was uh, higher than mm -hmm. the two homozygotes. This is dry panicle weight over dominance. Again, in F1, you have uh, around 100 over dominance. Whereas the 50% top plants, this is to show that whether heterosis was mediated by a single dialectic uh, gene. So you have here the top 50% of the plants, 
resulted about 60% uh, of the F1 heterosis. Whereas the heterozygote again is slightly higher as compared to the two homozygotes, F2 was around 25% overall. The, this indicates that much of the F1 heterosis was not retained in F2 population, uh, which indicates that so many genes are involved with, uh, in heterosis. This is the retention of F1 heterosis. In F2, you see the, uh, so here about 60% of uh, the heterosis was retained by the top 50% of the plants, whereas about 32% of the F1 heterosis was retained by the heterozygote for the candidate locus. So you see there is variation between homozygote 1 and homozygote 2 in terms of retaining the F1 heterosis. So probably you may say that uh, there is some, um, some level of uh, heterosis or advantage due to heterozygosity at the candidate locus. So you see that uh, top 50% of um, the plants should maintain or, or most of or 100% of the F1 heterosis. You see here, it is, I have tested this one statically. They should maintain about uh, most or 100% of the F1 heterosis. If a single gene was to, to mediate this, but, but it was not true, and it was only 60% of uh, the F1 heterosis was maintained by the top F2 uh, plants. This is a panicle language. So you see here, there is no heterosis for panicle language. Uh, the hybrid was more or less similar to the second parent. So panicle language may not be contributing for heterosis. So you see that, uh, again, there is the, the hybrid is not included in the second cross. Probably it would be the same as uh, the other parent, we don't know. Now the parent one is a bit uh, shorter in panicle language, but there was no significant difference between the three uh, F2 genotypes. Okay, now let's see the panicle traits. So which of the panicle traits are contributing to heterosis here? The first diagram shows the number of primary branches. Mm, again, the, it seems that there is a small uh, advantage from the F1 as compared to the two parents, uh, but uh, there is no much uh, heterosis in number of primary branches. Whereas, uh, again, length of primary branch a bit uh, up, yeah, we can say there is heterosis for this one, but uh, more clear one is uh, the secondary branching and as well the, the tertiary branching. So. And instead of the primary branch or the length of the primary branch, you may expect that uh, the yield advantage may be coming from the um, number of secondary and tertiary branches. Here you see in the F1, in both cases, you have uh, relatively uh, considerable level of uh, heterosis in both uh, number of secondary and tertiary branches. Uh, whereas in the serigenotypes, types, there was no variation, again, in primary branch, primary, length of primary branch, and tertiary and secondary branch as well. So the question is why most of the F1 heterosis was not maintained in F2 population? Or it was partially maintained in F2 population. So the, the first reason maybe is a recombination. That, that means um, candidate marker was not uh, strongly associated with uh, genes governing the the heterosis, or there may be inter interlocus interaction here. Uh, we see that here, yeah. we have the candidate locus here on chromosome 4. So this locus may be interacting with another locus here, or here, or maybe it may be interacting with, on the same chromosome with another locus. So another suggestion to see is to analyze maybe interaction between locus for this candidate mar marker. On a separate study, we have um, identified this, uh, the panicle ontogeny of uh, two sorghum inbreeds. So around 31 and 38 days after sowing, the two inbreed lines were uh, in reproductive phase already. And here you see the branching starting shortly after the transition from vegetative to reproductive phase primary branch, secondary branch, and also here initiation of um, spikelets, as well as initiation of stamen and pistil primordia around 46 and 51 day after sowing in SCB-018 and SCB-139. So here you see that there is a variation in branching nature, in timing 
of uh, emerging the different pinnacle architectures. Let's see also, this is the um, RPX length characteristics of the two uh, founder lines, SCB-139 and SCB-018. So in both cases, you see uh, a third degree polynomial, initially with a slow growth pattern in both, and eventually followed by a rapid growth in RPX length. So this shows the, the uh, mean RPX growth rate on a y-axis and the days in the reproductive phase. Here you see that there is a, a shift in rank between the two genotypes. So this indicates that in early stage, SCB-139 was uh, fast growing as compared to SCB-018, but eventually leveled off and again, SCB-018 overtaking the, 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 the position. So sometimes it may be misleading to judge uh, on the way before the final phenotype is done. So in conclusion, we can say that heterozygosity for the candidate locus uh, uh, had no significant effect or the effect was very small. So the first uh, suggestion maybe is uh, there may, be, may not be close linkage between the target gene and the candidate marker. And uh, whereas uh, there was uh, some tendency of uh, increased panicle weight or dry panicle weight due to heterozygous that candidate locus. So this may indicate that there is contribution from several genomic regions. So among these, the candidate locus may be contributing for dry panicle weight as well. So F2 population 3 retained about 25% of uh, the F1 heterosis, whereas the top 50 50% uh, of F2 and the heterozygous retained around 60 and 32 percent of the F1 heterosis, respectively, which indicates that several genes are involved with mediating the heterosis in F1. So probably most important from this uh, finding that is there is, um, there seems that the heterosis may be due to interaction between locus. That is a kind of epistatic interaction between different locus. This is one of uh, uh, the suggestions I think we need to analyze further markers and this, of course, candidate locus may be in interaction with uh, other locus, maybe on a different chromosome or on the same chromosome, but it indicates that there is uh, some kind of interaction between the locus. So we need to for analyze further on other markers, like we have seen it, adjacent markers close to the candidate marker for any epistatic interaction with other locus. And also, we have also seen from this finding, this study, that there is variation in timing, mm -hmm. nature of panic elongation and branching, as well as apex growth rate between different founder lines, which suggests that uh, the need for time reference uh, for when phenotyping. Otherwise, it may be sometimes misleading to to judge before time. So. All of these, so these are the, some of the references. Thank you very much. And with a special acknowledgement to Emery Ben Israel, he was a PhD student in our lab, still he's doing his PhD. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hapte, for uh, giving this uh, nice presentation and uh, completing it just on time. Uh, we have some time for questions, please. Yes, Shahal. Let's start up. Um, microphone? Oh, Moses. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, please, Moses. Uh, yeah, have to. I would like to know the source of your parental lines and, and, and then the features of the parental lines that motivated you to select those lines and to study it in this, uh, this year project. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Nana. So the, the source of my parental lines were uh, the Israeli core sorghum collection. There were a total of about 200 sorghum collections, which represent uh, all over the world. Then these were uh, also, some of the collections were uh, retrieved from Israeli Gen Bank. So out of these 200 uh, 
sorghum collections. 20 founder lines were identified based on their heterozygous and based on their diversity and uh, relatedness uh, after studying for polymorphism using about 51 SSR markers. So these founder lines are supposed to be representing uh, most of the sorghum genome. And we can say about 200 sorghum collections. So, uh, so this, this is the source of uh, the parental lines I used in this experiment. Yes, Shahal, please. Towards the, towards the end of your talk, you presented data on the apex elongation dynamics of the two parental lines, and you showed that there is a switch uh, in the grading between the two parents. Yes. Yeah. Do you know, uh, or is anybody in the laboratory trying to do this kind of analysis also on the F2 population? Maybe this will help to explain part of the of the uh, of the the yield or uh, reproductive uh, traits uh, phenotypes that you are observing. Mm. Uh, this this is not tested in F2 population, but uh, this was um, basically this experiment was done to to see to compare. Uh, the inbreed lines or the founder lines uh, against their hybrid. We were including the hybrid as well, but we only presented the, the two founder lines. The hybrid is missing because we couldn't verify that it was a true hybrid. It was mm, basically to compare the three genotypes, the two founder lines with uh, the hybrid, and it's not tested in F2. Most probably, we may have similar uh, pattern if we test it in F2, uh, but this. Oh, final phenotype is not. It's not possible. It's destructive type, and uh, we couldn't see the final phenotype. But uh, it's indicative. This is to indicate that uh, early stage measurements sometimes may be misleading, like uh, studying cell division or some activity before, see, like. Um, germination or sealing emergence, this may, may not be ac accurate in, in some case. This is um, an early phenotype, and that was the idea. Why is it destructive, Eyal? Can't you do it on, on one tiller and then, or up there? Why is it destructive? Can't you do it on one tiller and then let some other tillers uh, uh, bear seeds? Um, that uh, that is possible, but it doesn't uh, show the actual phenotype because you have to cut the plant. Once you cut the plant, it, it may if you allow the tiller to grow up and take a phenotype from the tiller, tillers also no, not a phenotype from the tiller. I mean, just to reproduce to, to for seed. Mm, we can we can get the seed, of course, possible. Yeah. Yeah, possible. That's possible. We can get the seed, but uh, tillers don't represent uh, actually. They they, they don't uh, express full of their potential. And so, for doing that, you actually have to to distract several plants at several times and and follow up the development. Yes, definitely. Yeah, we have um, every four days. We were extracting about five, four plants for. Every, I mean, it was done for more than about two months consecutively. This is a part of that uh, data. And it was a destructive something, yes. OK. Um, about the APES growth rate, what accounted for the rapid increase uh, for the two lines in this reproductive phase, especially at 16? What accounted for the rapid increase in the in the blue line? Uh, this is uh, typical of uh, the potential of the variation uh, in the potential of the two founder lines, SCB080. So they have a different, if you, I saw some published papers also. Uh, if you see the hybrid, if the hybrid was here, you may have seen a clear, vis uh, clear view of that. So there is variation, if you see the first one, this graph, 
you have here um, a slow growth phase initially, uh, whereas usually the hybrids um, grow very faster in this, re in this time, in this region, in rapid growing stage. This is from a uh, different study. I didn't include in my study. Uh, so it is typical of uh, uh, the potential of the founder lines and the nature of growing, accumulating biomass and that was uh, the reason for the variation between the two founder lines. I have another question uh, up there. You were trying to investigate the, the effect of a specific locus on heterosis. Are, there an, are, the, are you aware of other examples where a single locus have a, a, such a profound effect on heterosis to be defined as a major locus of, of uh, heterotic effect? Yes, yeah, there have been a uh, few uh, examples like uh, in a study by Craig et al. Actually, it was um, from a mutation, but uh, a single uh, gene mutation in a single locus resulted about 60% yield advantage in Prometo. This has been published recently in 2010, so it's possible to get a high level of heterosis from uh, a single gen, a single locus. That has been demonstrated, but uh, we can ask how much uh, uh, there is the probability from a natural population, they, how, much, how can we get that mutation in natural population, or how the approach is a bit different, but it seems uh, improbable uh, to find in other crops also, but it's definitely possible to, to get a high level of heterosis from a single gene also. Other question, Guy? Okay, so let me, please join me, thank you for this, for this. What, was there another question? Okay, so thank you, Hafte, for this uh, nice opening of the student presentation. And uh, we shall uh, go now for a coffee break for uh, 20 minutes, and we shall uh, resume at uh, 10.50. Uh, the last students that still have their uh, updated presentations,